Hello, Cardinals. Today we are continuing our reading of Octavia Butler's Kindred, The Fall, 5. But for three days I didn't see Rufus, nor did anything happen to bring on the dizziness that did, would tell me I was going to go home at last. I helped Sarah as well as I could. She seemed to warm up to me a little, and she was patient with my ignorance of cooking. She taught me and saw to it that I ate better. No more cornmeal mush when she realized I didn't like it. Why didn't you say something, she asked me. Under her direction, I spent God knows how long be uh, beating biscuit dough with a hatchet on a well-worn tree stump. Not so hard, you ain't driving nails, regular, like this. I cleaned and plucked a chicken, prepared vegetables, kneaded bread dough, and when Sarah was weary of me, helped carry in the other house servants with their work. I kept Kevin's room clean, I brought him hot water to wash and shave with, and I washed in his room. It was the only place I could go for privacy. I kept my canvas bag there and went there to avoid Margaret Whalen when she came rubbing her fingers over dustless furniture and looking under rugs on well-swept floors. Differences be damned, I did not know how to I did know how to sweep and dust no matter what century it was. Margaret Whalen complained because she couldn't find anything to complain about. That she made perfectly clear to me the day she threw scalding hot coffee at me, screaming that I had brought it to her cold. So I hid from her in Kevin's room. It was my refuge, but it was not my sleeping place. I had been giving a given a sleeping place in the attic where most of the house servants slept. It apparently never occurred to anyone that I should sleep in Kevin's room. Waylon knew what kind of relationship Kevin was supposed to have with me, and he made it clear that he didn't care, but our sleeping arrangement told us that he expected discretion, or we assumed it did. We cooperated for three days. On the fourth day, Kevin caught me on my way to the cookhouse and took me to the oak tree again. Are you having trouble with Margaret Waylon? he asked. Nothing I can't handle, I asked, surprised. Why? I heard a couple of the house servants talking, just saying vaguely that there was trouble. I thought I should find out for sure. I shrugged. I think she resents me because Rufus likes me. She probably doesn't want to share her son with anyone. Heaven help him when he gets a little older and tries to break away. Also, I don't think Margaret likes educated slaves any better than her husband does. I see. I was right about him, by the way. He can barely read and write, and she's not much better. He turned to face me squarely. Did she throw a pot of hot coffee on you? I looked away. It doesn't matter. Most of it missed anyway. Why didn't you tell me? She could have hurt you. She didn't. I don't think we should give her another chance. I looked at him. What do you want to do? Get out of here. We don't need money badly enough for you to put up with whatever she plans to do next. No, Kevin, I had a reason for not telling you about the coffee. I'm wondering what else you haven't told me. Nothing important. My mind went back over some of Margaret's petty insults. Nothing important enough to make me leave. But why? There's no reason for... Yes, there is, Kevin. I've thought about it, Kevin. It isn't the money that I care about or even having a roof over my head. I think we can survive here together no matter what. But I don't think I have much chance to, of surviving here alone. I've told you that. You won't be alone. I'll see to it. You'll try. Maybe that will be enough. I hope so. But if it isn't, if I do have to come here alone... I'll have a better chance of surviving if I stay here now and work on the insurance we talked about, Rufus. He'll probably be old enough to have some authority when I come again, old enough to help me. I want him to have as many good memories of me as I can give him now. He might not remember you past the day you leave here. He'll remember. It still might not work. After all, his environment will be influencing him every day you're gone. And from what I've heard, it's common in this time for master's children to be on nearly equal terms with the slaves, but... Maturity is supposed to put both in their places. Sometimes it doesn't. Even here, not all children let themselves be molded into what their parents want them to be. You're gambling. Hell, you're gambling against history. What else can I do? I've got to try, Kevin. And if trying means taking small risks and putting up with small humiliations now so that I can survive later, I'll do it. He drew a deep breath and let it out in an ear whistle. Yeah, I guess I don't blame you. I don't like it, but I don't blame you. I put my head on his shoulder. I don't like it either. God, I hate it. That woman is priming herself for a nervous breakdown. I just hope she doesn't have it while I'm here. Kevin shifted his position a little and sat up. Let's forget about Margaret for a moment, he said. I also wanted to talk to you about that, that place where you sleep. Oh? Yes, oh, I finally got up to see it. A rag pallet on the floor, Dana? Did you see anything else up there? What? What else should I have seen? 
a lot of rag pallets on the floor, and a couple of corn shuck mattresses. I'm not being treated any worse than any other house servant, Kevin, and I'm not doing and I'm doing better than the field hands. Their pallets are on the ground. Their cabins don't even have floors, and most of them are full of fleas. There was a long silence, and finally he sighed. I can't do anything for the others, he said, but I want you out of the attic. I want you with me. I sat up and stared down at my hands. You don't know how I've wanted to be with you. I kept imagining myself waking up at home some morning, alone. Not likely. Not unless something threatens you or endangers you during the night. You don't know that for sure. Your theory could be wrong. Maybe there's some kind of limit on how long I can stay here. Maybe a bad dream would be enough to send me home. Maybe anything. Maybe I should test my theory. That stopped me. I realized he was talking about endangering me himself, or at least making me believe my life was in danger, scaring the hell out of me, scaring me home, maybe. I swallowed. That might be a good idea, but I don't think you should have mentioned it to me, warned me. Besides, I'm not so sure you could scare me enough. I trust you. He covered one of my hands with his own. You can go on trusting me. I won't hurt you, but... I don't have to hurt you. I can arrange something that will scare you before you have time to think about it. I can handle it. I accepted that, began to think maybe he really could get us home. Kevin, wait until Rufus's legs is, is healed. So long, he protested. Six weeks, maybe more. Hell, in a society as backward as this one... Who knows whether the leg will heal at all? Whatever happens, the boy will live. He still has to father a child. And that means he'll probably have time to call me here again, with or without you. Give me the chance I need, Kevin, to reach him and make him a haven for myself here. All right, he said, sighing. We'll wait a while. But you won't do your waiting in the attic. You're moving into my room tonight. I thought about that. All right, getting you home with me when I go is the one thing more important than, to me than staying with Rufus. It's worth getting kicked off the plantation for. Don't worry about that. Waylon doesn't care what I do. But Margaret will care. I've seen her using that limited reading ability of hers on her Bible. I suspect she has her own way. She's fairly a moral woman. You don't want to know how moral she is? His tone made me frown. What do you mean? If she chases me any harder, she and I will end up wind up playing a scene from the Bible, she reads. The scene between uh, Potiphar's wife and Joseph. I swallowed that woman, but I could see in my, her in my mind's eye, long, thick, red hair piled high on her head, fine, smooth skin. Whatever her emotional problems, she wasn't ugly. I'm moving in tonight, all right, I said. He smiled. If we're quiet about it, they might not even bother to notice. Hell, I saw three little kids playing in the dirt back there who look more like Waylon than Rufus does. Margaret's had a lot of practice at not noticing. I knew which children he meant. They had different mothers, but there was a definite family resemblance between them. I'd seen Margaret Whalen slap one of them hard across the face. The child had done nothing more than toddle into her path. If she was willing to punish a child for her husband's sins, would she be any less willing to punish me if she knew uh, that I was where she wanted to be, with Kevin? I tried not to think about it. We still might have to leave, I said, no matter what these people have to accept from each other. They might not be willing to tolerate immorality from us. He shrugged. If we have to leave, we leave. There's a limit to what you should put up with, even if you get your chance with the boy. We'll work our way to Baltimore. I should be able to get some kind of job there. If we go to a city, how about Philadelphia? Philadelphia? Because it's in Pennsylvania. If we let leave here, let it be for a free state. Oh, yes, I should have thought of that myself. Look, Dana, we might have to go to one of these free states anyways, he hesitated. I mean, if it turns out we can't get home the way we think we can, I'll probably become an unnecessary expense to Waylon when Rufus's leg heals, and then we'd have to make a home for ourselves somewhere. That probably won't happen, but it's a possibility. I nodded. Now let's get, go get whatever belongs to you out of the attic. He stood up, and Dana, Rufus says his mother is going out visiting today. He'd like to see you while she's gone. Why didn't you tell me sooner? A start, finally. Later that day, as I was mixing some cornbread batter for Sarah, Carrie came to get me. She made a sign for Sarah that I had already learned to understand. She wiped the side of her face with one hand as though rubbing something off, and then she pointed to me. Dana, said Sarah over her shoulder, one of the white folks wants you. Go with Carrie. I went. Carrie led me up to Rufus's room, knocked, and left me there. I went in and found Rufus in bed with his legs sandwiched between the two boards of a wooden splint and held straight by a device of rope and cast iron. 
The iron weight looked like something borrowed from Sarah's kitchen, a heavy little hooked thing I'd seen her hang meat on to roast, but apparently it served just as well to keep Rufus's leg in traction. How are you feeling, I asked as I sat down in the chair beside his bed. It doesn't hurt as much as it did, he said. I guess it's getting well. Kevin said, do you care if I call him Kevin? No, I think he wants you to. I have to call him Mr. Franklin when Mama is here. Anyway, he said you're working with Aunt Sarah. Aunt Sarah? Well, that was better than Mammy Sarah, I supposed. I'm learning her way of cooking. She's a good cook, but does she hit you? Of course not, I laughed. She had a girl in there a while back, and she used to hit her. The girl finally asked Daddy, Daddy to let her go back to the fields. That was right after Daddy sold Aunt Sarah's boys, though. Aunt Sarah was mad at everybody then. I don't blame her, I said. Rufus glanced at the door and then said low voice, Neither do I. Her boy Jim was my friend. He taught me how to ride when I was little, but Daddy sold him anyways. He glanced at the door again and changed the subject. Dana, can you read? Yes. Kevin said you could. I told Mama and she said you couldn't. I shrugged. What do you think? He took a leather-bound book from under his pillow. Kevin brought me this from downstairs. Would you read it to me? I fell in love with Kevin all over again. Here was the perfect excuse for me to spend a lot of time with the boy. The book was Robinson Crusoe. I had read it when I was little, and I could rem remember not really liking it, but not quite being able to put it down. Crusoe had, after all, been on a slave trading voyage when he was shipwrecked. I opened the book with some apprehension, wondering what archaic spelling and punctuation I would face. I found the expected F's for S's and a few other things that didn't turn up as often, but I got used to them very quickly, and I began to get into Robinson Crusoe. As a kind of castaway myself, I was happy to escape into the fictional world of someone else's trouble. I read and read and drank some of the water Rufus's mother had left for him and read some more. Rufus seemed to enjoy it. I didn't stop until I thought he was falling asleep, but even then, as I put the book down, he opened his eyes and smiled. Nigel said your mother was a school teacher. She was. I like the way you read. It's almost like being there watching everything happen. Thank you. There's a lot more books downstairs. I've seen them. I had also wondered about them. The Waylands didn't seem to be the kind of people who would have a library. They belonged to Miss Hannah Rufus, uh, uh, explained Rufus obligingly. Daddy was married to her before he married Mama, but she died. This place used to be hers. He, sh he said she read so much that before he married Mama, he made sure she didn't like to read. What about you? He moved uncomfortably. Reading's too much trouble. Mr. Jennings said I was too stupid to learn anyway. Who's Mr. Jennings? He's the schoolmaster. Is he? I shook my head in disgust. He shouldn't be. Listen, do you think you're stupid? No. A small hesitant no. But I read as good as Daddy does already. Why should I have to do more than that? You don't have to. You can stay just the way you are. Of course, that would give Mr. Jennings the satisfaction of thinking he was right about you. Do you like him? Nobody likes him. Don't be so eager to satisfy him, then. And what about the boys you go to school with? Is it? It's just boys, isn't it? No girls? Yeah. Well, look at the advantage they're going to have over you when you grow up. They'll know more than you do. They'll be able to cheat you if they want to. Besides, I held up Robinson Crusoe. Look at the pleasure you'll miss. He grinned. Not with you here. Read some more. I don't think I better. It's getting late. Your mother will be home soon. No, she won't. Read. I sighed. Ruth, your mother doesn't like me. I think you know that. He looked away. We have a little more time, he said. Maybe you'd better not read, though. I forget to listen for her when you read. I handed him the book. You read me a few lines. He accepted the book and looked at it as though it were his enemy. After a moment, he began to read haltingly. Some words stopped him entirely, and I had to help. After two painful paragraphs, he stopped and shut the book in disgust. You can't even tell it's the same book when I read it, he said. Let Kevin teach you, I said. He doesn't believe you're stupid, and neither do I. You'll learn all right. Unless he really did have some kind of problem, poor vision or some learning disability that people in this time would see as stubbornness or stupidity. Unless. What did I know about teaching children? All I could do was hope the boy had as much potential as I thought he did. I got up to go and then sat down again, remembering another unanswered question. Ruth, whatever happened to Alice? Nothing, he looked surprised. I mean, the last time I saw her, her father had just been beaten because he went to see her and her mother. Oh, well, Daddy was afraid he'd run off, so he sold him to a trader. Sold him? Does he still live around here? No, the trader was headed south to Georgia, I think. Oh, God, I sighed. Are Alice and her mother still here? 
Sure, I still see them when I can walk. Did they have any trouble because I was with them that night? That was as near as I dared to come to asking what happened to my would-be enslaver. I don't think so. Alice said you came and went away quick. I went home. I can't tell you when I'm going to do that. It just happens. Back to California? Yes. Alice didn't see you go. She said you just went into the woods and didn't come back. That's good. Seeing me vanish would have frightened her. Alice was keeping her mouth closed, too, then, or her mother was. Alice might not know what happened. Clearly, there were the other things that even a friendlier young white could not be told. On the other hand, if the patroller himself hadn't spread the word about me or taken revenge on Alice and her mother, maybe he was dead. My blow could have killed him, or someone else could have finished him after I went home. If they had, I didn't want to know about it. I got up again. I have to go, Roof. I'll see you whenever I can. Dana? I looked down at him. I told Mama who you were. I mean that you were the one who saved me from the river. She said it wasn't true, but I think she really believed me. I told her because I thought it might make her like you better. It hasn't, uh, that I've noticed. I know, he frowned. Why doesn't she like you? Did you do something to her? Not likely. After all, what would happen to me if I did something to her? Yeah, but why doesn't she like you? You'll have to ask her. She won't tell me, he looked up solemnly. I keep thinking you're going to go home and that somebody will come and tell me that you and Kevin are gone. I don't want you to go, but I don't want you to get hurt here either. I said nothing. You be careful, he said softly. I nodded and left the room. Just as I reached the stairs, Tom Whalen came out of his bedroom. What are you doing up here, he demanded. Visiting Mr. Rufus, I said, he asked to see me. You were reading to him? Now, I knew how he happened to come out just in time to catch me. He had been eavesdropping, for God's sake. What had he expected to hear, or rather, what had he heard that he shouldn't have? About Alice, perhaps. What would he make of that? For a moment, my Rhine raced, searching for excuses, explanations, and then I realized I wouldn't need them. I would have met him outside Rufus's door if he had stayed long enough to hear about Alice. He would probably heard me addressing Rufus a little too familiarly. Nothing worse. I deliberately not said anything damaging about Margaret because I thought her own attitude would damage her more in her son's eyes than anything I could say. I made myself face Waylon calmly. Yes, I was reading to him, I admitted. He asked me to do that, too. I think he was bored lying in there with nothing to do. I didn't ask you what he thought, he said. I said nothing. He walked me... <laughs> He walked me further from Ruthus's door, then stopped and turned to look hard at me. His eyes went over me like a man sizing up a woman for sex, but I got no message of lust from him. His eyes, I noticed, not for the first time, were almost as pale as Kevin's. Rufus and his mother had bright green eyes. I liked the green better somehow. How old are you, he asked. Twenty-six, sir. You say that like you're sure. Yes, sir, I am. What year were you born? Seventeen ninety-three. I'd figured that out days ago, thinking it wasn't part of it wasn't a part of my personal history I should hesitate over if someone asked. At home, a person who hesitated over his birthday was probably about to lie. As I spoke, though, I realized that here a person might hesitate over their birth date simply because he didn't know it. Sarah didn't know hers. Twenty six then, said Waylon. How many children have you had? None. I kept my face impassive, but I couldn't keep myself from wondering where these questions were leading. No children by now, he frowned. You must be barren then. I said nothing. I wasn't about to explain anything to him. My fertility was none of his business anyway. He stared at me a little longer, making me angry and uncomfortable, but I concealed my feelings as well as I could. You like children, though, don't you, he asked. You like my boy? Yes, sir, I do. Can you cipher, too, along with your reading and writing? Yes, sir. How do you like to be the one doing the teaching? Me, I managed to frown, managed not to laugh out loud with relief. Tom Whalen wanted to buy me. In spite of all his warnings to Kevin of the dangers of owning educated northern-born slaves, he wanted to buy me. I pretended not to understand, but that's Mr. Franklin's job. Could be your job, could it? I could buy you. Then you'd live here instead of traveling around the country without enough to eat or a place to sleep. I lowered my eyes. That's for Mr. Franklin to say. I know it is, but how do you feel about it? Well, no offense, Mr. Whalen, I'm glad we stopped here, and as I said, I like your son, but I'd rather stay with Mr. Franklin. He gave me an unmistakable look of pity. If you do, girl, you'll live to regret it. He turned and walked away. I stared after him, believing in spite of myself that he really felt sorry for me. That night I told Kevin what had happened, and he wondered too. Be careful, Dana, he said, unwittingly echoing Rufus. Be as careful as you can. Six. I was careful. 
As the days passed, I got into the habit of being careful. I played the slave, minded my manners, probably more than I had to because I wasn't sure what I could get away with. Not much, as it turned out. Once I was called over to the slave cabins, the quarters, to watch Waylon punish a field hand for the crime of answering back. Waylon ordered the man stripped naked and tied to the trunk of a dead tree. As this was being done by other slaves, Waylon stood whirling his whip and biting his thin lips, and suddenly he brought the whip down across the slave's back. The slave's body jerked and strained against its rope, and I watched the whip for a moment, wondering whether it was like the one Waylon had used on Rufus years before. If it was, I understood completely why Margaret Waylon had taken the boy and fled. The whip was heavy and at least six feet long, and I wouldn't have used it on anything living. It drew blood and screams at every blow. I watched and listened and longed to be away, but Waylon was making an example of the man. He had ordered all of us to watch the beating all the slaves. Kevin was in the main house somewhere, probably not even aware of what was happening. The whipping served its purpose as far as I was concerned. It scared me, made me wonder how long it would be, bef uh, it would be before I made a mistake that would give someone a reason to whip me, or had I already made that mistake. I moved into Kevin's room after all, and though that would be perceived by, as Kevin's doing, I could be made to suffer for it. The fact that the Waylands didn't seem to notice my move gave me no real comfort. Their lives and mine were so separate that it might take them several days to realize that I had abandoned my place in the attic. I always got up before they did to get water and live coals from the cookhouse to start Kevin's fire. Matches had apparently not been invented yet. Neither Sarah nor Rufus had ever heard of them. By now, the manservant Wayland had assigned to Kevin ignored him completely, and Kevin and his room were left to me. It took us twice as long to get a fire started, and it took me longer to carry water up and down the stairs, but I didn't care. The jobs I had assigned myself gave me legitimate reason for going in and out of Kevin's room at all hours, and they kept me from being assigned more disagreeable work. Most important to me, though, they gave me a chance to preserve a little of seven, 1976 amid the slaves and slaveholders. After washing and watching Kevin, or watching Kevin bloody his face with the straight razor he had borrowed from Waylon, I would go down to help Sarah with breakfast. Whole mornings went by without my seeing either of the Waylands. At night, I helped clean up after supper and prepare for the next day. So, like Sarah and Carrie, I rose before the Waylands and went to bed after them. They gave me several days of peace before Margaret Wayland discovered that she had another reason to dislike me. She cornered me one day as I swept the library. If she had walked in two minutes earlier, she would have caught me reading a book. Where did you sleep last night, she demanded in a strident, accusing voice she reserved for slaves. I straightened to face her, rested my hands on the broom. How lovely it would have been to say, none of your business, bitch. Instead, I spoke softly, respectfully. In Mr. Franklin's room, ma'am, I didn't bother to lie because all the house servants knew. It might even have been one of them who alerted Margaret. So now what would happen? Margaret slapped me across the face. I stood very still, gazed down at her with frozen calm. She was three or four inches shorter than I was and proportionately smaller. Her slap hadn't hurt me much. It simply made me want to hurt her. Only my memory of the whip kept me still. You filthy black horse, she shouted. This is a Christian house. I said nothing. I'll see you sent to the quarter where you belong. Still, I said nothing. I looked at her. I won't have you in my house. And she took a step back from me. You stop looking at me that way, she said, and she took another step back. It occurred to me that she was a little afraid of me. I was an unknown, after all, an unpredictable new slave, and maybe I was a little too silent. Slowly, deliberately, I turned my back and went on sweeping. I kept an eye on her, though, without seeming to. After all, she was as unpredictable as I was. She could pick up a candlestick or a vase and hit me with it, and whip or no whip, I wasn't going to stand passively and let her really hurt me. But she made no move toward me. Instead, she turned and rushed away. It was a hot day, muggy and uncomfortable, but no one else was moving very, moving very fast except to wave away flies, but Margaret Raylan still what, rushed everywhere. She had little or nothing to do. Slaves kept her house clean, did much of her sewing, all of her cooking and washing. Carrie even helped her put on her clothes and take them off, so Margaret supervised, ordered people to do work they were already doing, criticized their slowness and laziness even when they were quick and industrious, and in general made trouble. Waylon had married a poor, uneducated, nervous, startlingly pretty young woman who was determined to be the kind of person she thought of as a lady. That meant she didn't do menial work or any work at all, apparently. I had no one to compare her to except her guests, who seemed at least to be calmer. But I suspected that most women of her time 
found enough to do them to keep themselves comfortably busy, whether they thought of themselves as ladies or not. Margaret, in her boredom, simply rushed around and made a nuisance of herself. I finished my work in the library, wondering all the while whether Margaret had gone to her husband about me. Her husband, I feared. I remembered the expression on his face when he had been beaten the field hand. It hadn't been gleeful or angry or even particularly interested. He could have been chopping wood. He wasn't sadistic, but he didn't shrink from his duties as master of the plantation. He would beat me bloody if he thought I had given him reason, and Kevin might not even find out until too late. I went up to Kevin's room, but he wasn't there. I heard him when I passed Rufus's room, and I would have gone in, but a moment later I heard Margaret's voice. Repelled, I went back downstairs and out to the cookhouse. Sarah and Carrie were alone when I went in, and I was glad of that. Sometimes old people and children lounged there, or house servants, or even field hands stealing a few moments of leisure. I liked to listen to them talk sometimes and fight my way through their accents to find out more about how they survived lives of slavery. Without knowing it, they prepared me to survive. But now I wanted only Sarah and Carrie. I could see the way I felt around them and wouldn't get back to either of the Waylands. I'm sorry. I could say what I felt around them and it wouldn't get back to either of the Waylands. Dana, Sarah greeted me. You be careful. I spoke for you today. I don't want you making me out to be a liar. I frowned. Spoke for me to Miss Margaret? Sarah gave a short, a short, harsh laugh. No, you know I don't say more to her than I can help. She's got her house and I got my kitchen. I smiled and my own trouble receded a little. Sarah was right. Margaret Wayland kept out of her way. Talk between them was brief and confined usually only to meal planning. Why do you just like her so if she doesn't bother you, I asked. Sarah gave me the look of silent rage that I had not uh, seen since my first day on the plantation. Whose idea do you think it was to sell my babies? Oh, she had not mentioned her lost children since that first day either. She wanted new furniture, new china dishes, fancy things you see in that house now. What she had was good enough for Miss Hannah, and Miss Hannah was a real lady, quality, but it wasn't enough for white trash Margaret. So she made Master Tom sell my three boys to get money to buy things she didn't even need. Oh, I couldn't think of anything else to say. My trouble seemed to shrink and not become worth mentioning. Sarah was silent for a while, her hands kneading bread dough automatically, maybe with a little more vigor than necessary, and finally she spoke again. It was Master Tom I spoke t uh, to for you. I jumped. Am I in trouble? Not by anything I said. He just wanted to know how you work and are you lazy. I told him you wasn't lazy, told him you didn't know how to do some things, and girl, you come here not knowing how to do nothing, but I didn't tell him that. I said, if you don't know how to do something, you find out and you work. I tell you to do something, I know it's going to be done. Master Tom say he might buy you. Mr. Franklin won't sell me. She lifted her head a little and literally looked down her nose at me. No, guess he won't. Anyway, Miss, Mar Miss Margaret don't want you here. I shrugged. Bitch, muttered Sarah monotonous, uh, uh, monoton dude, monotonously, sorry guys, then, well, greedy and mean as she is, at least she doesn't bother Carrie much, I looked at the mute, mute girl, eating stew and cornbread left over from the table of the white, doesn't she, Carrie, Carrie shook her head and kept eating, of course, said Sarah, turning away from the bread dough, Carrie don't have nothing Miss Margaret wants, I just looked at her. You're caught between, she said. You know that, don't you? One man ought to be enough for her. Don't matter what ought to be, matters what is. Make him let you sleep in the attic again. Make him? Girl, she smiled a little. I see you and him together sometimes when you think nobody's looking. You can make him do just about anything you want him to do. Her smile surprised me. I would have expected her to be disgusted with me or with Kevin. Fact, she continued, if you got any sense, you'll try to get him to free you now while you're still young and pretty enough for him to live in. I looked at her appraisingly, large, dark set eyes and a full, unlined face, several shades lighter than my own. She had been pretty herself not long ago and was still an attractive woman. I spoke to her softly. Were you sensible, Sarah? Did you try when you were younger? She stared hard at me. Her large eyes suddenly narrowed. Finally, she walked away without answering.